So we're going to call the meeting to order. My name is Jody French. I am a commissioner from New Fame, and I'm filling in for Lou Sorensen, chair of the Transportation Committee. We're going to take the liberty of moving minutes approval off the agenda and table that for a meeting uh, next month when Lou hopefully can be here. And we'll head right into the business portion of the meeting. The first item is Vermont's Clean Water and Municipal Transportation Outreach Meeting. And Jim Ryan from the Department of Environmental Conservation will present on Act 64 and some upcoming permit requirements. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Yeah, that was, uh, so to couple. Matt. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming tonight. Um, <coughs> as, <clears throat> as some of you may know, uh, Act 64 was passed last legislative session. Um, the Vermont Clean Water Initiative, uh, and what it essentially does is to cap um, uh, usage or uh, cap. Um, yep, sorry, um, cap the uh, the amount of nutrients uh, that are flowing into the Vermont uh, Vermont lakes and, and waterways. Uh, and what we're going to be focusing on after a brief overview of the act is essentially the municipal road roadway permit uh, portion of it and what uh, the new permit process is going to entail for towns uh, to regulate um, the stormwater coming off of paved and unpaved roads uh, in their municipality. So without further ado, uh, Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan, I'm with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation in the Watershed Management Division and uh, I was a a watershed coordinator for 16 or so years and took on this position back in July um, after Act 64, the Vermont Clean Water Act was passed and uh, uh, this new program, the Municipal Roads Program was created. Um, just wanted to point out Marie Caduto in the room, DEC watershed coordinator for um, this area, this region of the state um, and um, might be pointing out some questions later on for and areas that Marie can um, answer some questions as well. Um, all right. So the uh, origins of um, this municipal roads program and many of the water, new water quality initiatives out of Act 64 really came out of the Lake Champlain Phosphorus TMDL, even though I know we're not in Lake Champlain here, uh, but uh, uh, it's, Lake Champlain is an impaired water body due to excessive uh, phosphorus, and uh, we at the Agency of Natural Resources have been working on improving uh, Lake Champlain's water quality um, over the last probably 15 years or so. Um, and uh, we, uh, we were um, asked to ramp things up from EPA to, to show more water quality improvement in Lake Champlain. Um, and we wound up coming up with uh, this as a, a pie chart of a, the phosphorus budget or the phosphorus TMDL, what some of the sources of phosphorus were from different land uses in the Lake Champlain Basin, but it really applies statewide um, to give a sense more on the this proportion scale rather than the specific numbers of where some of our statewide sources of phosphorus are with agriculture the greatest source at 40 percent roughly stream bank erosion almost a quarter forest lands uh, 15 percent and waste water tre treatment facilities a very small percentage is three percent but the unpaved roads um, it's about 6% and also includes, we also have a paved road component, so we're about 10% or so uh, of the phosphorus source um, coming from com computer models derived from Tetra Tech of, of where some of the phosphorus sources are. Um, and this is, this is, again, this is Lake Champlain Basin, but by sub-basin it varies quite a lot depending on the <coughs> slope and topography of where you are in the watershed. Lots of phosphorus from roads are coming actually from higher up in the watershed and the headwater streams, the smaller streams, the narrower valleys, more forested, um, less agricultural, so you have the higher concentration coming from, from roads themselves. 
And they range from, in, in, in this specific model, from 10%. Uh, this is just unpaved uh, roads, back roads, um, down to 7 5%, down a little sliver, 1% or 2% in St. Olaf's Bay. Uh, UVM uh, has done a study of phosphorus and sediment sources by, so the, the, the previous pie charts were from models. This is actually from in-stream water quality measurements, both in-stream uh, measuring the water column, uh, turbidity, um, and phosphorus in the water, total phosphorus in the water column, but also looking at how much uh, se uh, sediment and phosphorus were, were in the road drainage network themselves. And um, this, these blue bars are essentially the smaller headwater streams and the larger rivers are the red bars. And the sediment percentage, is, they're higher um, in the in larger streams, lower in the headwaters, but the phosphorus, as I mentioned before, the uh, percentages are a lot higher in the headwater streams. Um, and again, there's a lot of different sources of sediment and phosphorus, uh, other water quality issues that we have in the state. And each of these different land uses, um, there are new regulations that apply. And we're going to get a little bit into it, but um, agriculture, uh, roads paved, unpaved, both state roads and municipal roads, all road classes. Uh, developed land, we really, we're really talking about impervious surfaces, parking lots, <coughs> rooftops, uh, more on the uh, private and commercial side, uh, logging related, forest, uh, forestry, uh, erosion, wastewater treatment plants, and again, um, more municipal stormwater regulations. This is kind of just a visual of all the above, but uh, we're going to talk mostly about the roads today. But this is just to show that there are lots of other areas. And one in particular, um, stormwater areas of uh, impervious surface greater than three acres that hadn't typically that previously been permitted in the past uh, and have been grandfathered are now having to come in uh, to get uh, stormwater permits. So larger uh, commercial areas, parking lots, rooftops, um, even larger municipal, municipally owned lands, um, like larger school parking lots, are, are coming in as well. And oh, I just wanted to point out, and a lot of the priorities are identified um, in the tactical basin plans uh, with Marie and uh, her counterparts in different parts of the state. Um, where priorities, water quality priorities, are identified in the tactical planning process, and those are really the uh, what uh, a lot of the grant funders in the state are looking for in to seeing if these are these priorities have been identified in the tactical basin plan. On the agriculture side, there's new instead of the accepted agricultural practices, there are required agricultural practices, and they include uh, bigger buffers. Small farms are going to have a, a general permit, um, nutrient management plans, livestock fencing out of waterways, manure management, um, and focus on soil health and soil quality. On the stormwater side, as I was mentioning, we have the so not only municipal roads but um, state highways, um, uh, VTRANS maintained roads are will also be managed under the TS4 permit. That's going to be coming out this year, 2016. And we're going to talk about the municipal roads permit. This is what the <coughs> developed lands permit that I mentioned before, um, and uh, greater than three acres, and, uh, and updates to the stormwater manual as well. So we keep talking about sediment and nutrients. There's also nitrogen uh, issues associated with road runoff. Um, on the sediment side, we're not just talking about water quality uh, as far as cloudy water, turbid water, but we're also looking at impacts to aquatic habitat when we have a lot of sediment runoff from roads um, getting into the substrate and um, clogging uh, spawning areas, for example, or macroinvertebrate habitat, the, the, the bugs that uh, uh, fish and other uh, organisms eat. Uh, we have 
uh, this case we have algae bloom from, from uh, some excessive nutrients. We also have uh, associated with road runoff, we have antifreeze and oil and gasoline, the hydrocarbons, they're coming from cars. <coughs> and we have uh, metals, chlorides, salts, um, trash, um, so a lot of that winds up in waterways. We have close to 16,000 uh, road miles in Vermont, um, and that, that's state highway, municipal roads. 2,700 of those are state highway, and the uh, majority are, are municipally owned and maintained roads. That's all class, road classes. Um, this is a breakdown by road class. Are folks familiar with road classes here? We'll get a little bit into it uh, today. But uh, class one, these are really uh, village center roads for the most part. Um, they are paved roads for the most part. Uh, a lot of them have uh, catch basins, uh, sidewalks. Uh, class two um, uh, are, are roads generally that uh, important uh, roads for towns and generally connect more than one community. Uh, class three are your typical gravel road that uh, most towns maintain, and class four um, are very minimally maintained, but the vast majority of these class three roads. So out of uh, Act 64 came the uh, requirement to develop a municipal roads general permit, it's an MRGP, a Kind of to bombard folks with too many acronyms. Um, we have to develop a draft uh, general permit by the end of this year and then a final permit one year later. And towns would begin applying for coverage 2018 to 21. Um, what, we're, what we're primarily going to be covering in the permit are what we're, what we're calling priority segments of road. Um, we're not going to be focusing on every road mile in every town, but we really want to go after the road segments that could potentially cause the most uh, threat of erosion to an adjacent waterway, whether that waterway is a stream, a wetland, or a lake, or a pond. So to identify those segments of road that are closest, close proximity, steepest slope um, to, to waters, and are the greatest threat to waterways, and then see if those if there is erosion coming from those segments of road, and if there is uh, erosion coming from those roads, making sure that their best management practices apply to those sections of road. The first step in identifying the priority road segments, um, we we're using this, this term of connected roads and priority roads kind of interchangeably here, but we have this uh, road erosion risk analysis or risk ranking that's on our uh, Agency of Natural Resources website that uh, every town there's a layer here where you can punch in your town name and you can pull up all your road la your road layer for the town and you'll see uh, a, a color highlighted for each segment of road. Um, green is a low erosion risk, yellow or medium erosion risk and red or high erosion risk and generally that's like a high erosion risk would be a <coughs> steep road very close to a stream or a wetland or a lake generally there might be a stream crossing or a culvert there that that culvert may be undersized the soil uh, the adjacent soil and, and making up the roadway are highly erodible soils um, and um, those would all be kind of red flags that this segment of road uh, could cause an erosion problem. So we want to do an inventory with the first cut. That, that's a GIS level assessment that has not been field verified. We uh, will be contracting out to have folks in the field looking at these low, medium, high risk segments, field ver verifying them to, in fact, um, see if they are erosion threats and rank them and prioritize them and also delineate them. So each town, each high priority segment would be delineated on a map and have an uphill start point, generally a, a stream or wetland at the bottom, and then another uphill, kind of that road 
uh, watershed area or that area of the road that drains to that lowest denominator, which is usually <coughs> a surface water. And then uh, making recommendations on what best management practices should be in place there if there are, if there are erosion issues and coming up with a, a cost estimate, a restoration plan, and a schedule. <coughs> so the, the uh, road general permit um, is not an individual permit. The road general permit will essentially be, will have these components, so a road stormwater management plan, which will include total roads by road type. I'll get into the road types in a minute. Um, a map of those high priority segments of road, which of those high priority segments of road meet our standards, and I'll get into the standards in a minute, and towns will be credited for work that they've already done, um, so we're encouraging towns to identify uh, those segments and start to address them, and then coming up with a plan of how towns are going to address those segments of road that don't meet standards um, over a 20 year period. In this example here, we had um, a town, most towns, the average road miles that, that towns manage, municipalities manage are 50 road miles. Um, in this example, we have a 50, 50 miles of road, total road miles in town. We are estimating about half of those road miles or what we're considering connected or priority road segments. So in this example, we have 50 road, total road miles, 50, uh, 25 miles of that or half of them are connected or priority road segments. So half of them already get kind of kicked out of what will be covered in the permit. And in this example, this town has already addressed erosion problems on 15 of those 25 connected priority segments. So they would have, if we just do the math down from 50, we're down to 10 road miles that this particular town would still need to do additional practices in order to be compliant with our permit. And in this example, this may be uh, a half of mile of road that would need to be addressed every year for 20 years. I'm going to try to make the uh, permit and the impl implementation of the permit simple, cost effective, and easy to maintain. Um, most of these practices, when we look at um, water quality improvements, it's, it's been shown that road best management practices are some of the most cost effective practices as far as water quality benefit per dollar spent. And we've seen this with the Better Back Roads program. Uh, it, um, it's, a, it's a very efficient way to address water quality with simple techniques. Towns often have the equipment and, um, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's just a culvert header, for example, here on the left and a stone line ditch over here on the right. Some of the practices are the practices that I use that term interchangeably with, with the standards. The standards will become the practices. Our um, stone line ditches, turnouts, uh, road crowning, culvert headers, and we'll be seeing pictures of some of these culvert outlet stabilization. Uh, for the more uh, urban areas or downtown areas, um, we have catch basins that need to be cleaned out regularly um, and street sweeping. Um, and uh, we're looking at some green stormwater infrastructure or, or formerly low impact development practices as some alternatives. So when we're talking about road types. Um, this is what we're looking at, uh, at least for the time being. This is only an example, but this is what some of the standards could look like, at least the format, where we have road type along one axis. Uh, those village center kind of paved curb, a lot of those class one roads, paved, uh, not curb, so that paved road that doesn't uh, have catch basins for more drainage ditches. That big pie chart percentage of class three gravel roads would fit into that column. And then class four uh, segments, which are about 12% of the roads, um, the standards would be a lot less stringent for class four road. Towns are not required to maintain those roads except for maintaining the stream crossings, but we do want to <coughs> address major water quality issues. So these are some, so some of the practices in these example here, they don't necessarily apply across the board um, to the different road types. It, it makes sense to match the, 
the practice with the road type. And we don't want to have to, we don't have road crowning uh, on, a, on a paved road, for example. We don't have catch basins on class four roads. Um, so it kind of makes sense to, to apply the practice to the road type. This is our, our town highway, typical of that um, cross section of highway um, where we're looking at really the, the, the roadway, the, or some people call it the travel, travel lane, and then we have the ditch portion of the cross section, um, and, um, and some, some ditches here, we have, if this is the road, <coughs> we have the typical road ditch here, your tra trapezoidal road, and in a lot of cases we have, <coughs> where we have one side of the road, um, where we can um, run the water off the road through sheet flow. It's a paved road example, catch basin, and a street sweeper there on the right. Part of the permit for those types of practices might be towns reporting how often are you cleaning out your catch basins, how, how often are you sweeping your streets. There has been some water quality studies to show that uh, street sweeping and vacuuming in the fall after leaf fall gets the greatest water quality benefit because a lot of the phosphorus gets uh, is, is, is in the leaf matter and if, you, if you're cleaning the leaves you're getting a better better water quality benefit. Uh, this is a green stormwater infrastructure practice uh, called a gravel wetland so we want to give towns the flexibility where it makes sense um, whether water quality wise or aesthetically or for other, for other reasons where uh, we want to uh, think outside the box on different practices. Turnouts, uh, getting water out of the drainage way and into some sort of filter area, <coughs> grass filter area or forest filter area before it gets to the stream. So this is, there's a, this, the road is up on the top here. Um, this is a very long, steep turnout stream down in the front of the screen here, but having a little uh, grass filter area out of that before it gets to the, to the stream. Um, so sometimes we use this um, uh, netting or hydro seeding to get grass established in a ditch, maybe depending on the time of year um, for the lower sloped dit, uh, uh, drainage ditches and, and roads. Uh, this is pretty typical of the stone line ditch on the steeper slopes. We've been um, working at, uh, with VTrans and looking at some sites where um, where this has worked well, where this has not worked well, and trying to come up with some lessons learned on where it worked well, why, is it the stone size, is it the, the slope itself, um, the degradation of rock, how much they're taking the rock up the side of the, the road so the grader can get in there and let the water off the road. This is, this should probably be the first slide here, but getting water off the road in the first place through a good crown, Having water flow off the road perpendicular to the road and immediately off the road as quick as possible as opposed to running down the middle of the road. And the crown doesn't necessarily have to go with a high point in the middle. It could be pitched to one side or the other depending on the road. If you have a narrow road where you might not be able to get a, a, a high point in the middle uh, as long as water is getting off the road. We, we found that through looking at some of the better back road sites that really taking the extra step and putting some good crushed process material um, after some drainage ditches or culverts were put in and just going that, that extra step and spending a little bit extra money goes a long way in keeping that practice in place instead of getting a mess like we have here on the left. Uh, we, we see having this false ditch where this is where water's running down the road parallel to the road instead of sheet flowing perpendicular into the ditch. Some people call this a greater berm or a secondary ditch or a false ditch. This is what it looks like out in, out in the road. That was this is that picture on the right is actually uh, going out with VTrans looking at some better back road sites and um, and you can see in that that site there look seeing the water running down down the middle of the road instead of into the ditch. See this a lot, sunken roads uh, or entrenched roads where the road 
itself is lower than the sides, and it's really hard to outlet the water. In this case, you have to get, get a little creative sometimes, but this is one of our challenging sites. Head cuts or gully erosion, um, a lot of times when culverts were, are put in, um, culverts may be put in too low or there's done a little excessive uh, digging and creating this uh, stream bed imbalance where the upstream higher stream bed is trying to match the lower uh, downstream bed causing a head cut and that so that has a tendency to migrate upstream and then all that erosion and sediment in turn plugs the culvert Culvert outlet stabilization, we see a lot of hanging culverts, perched culverts, a um, little waterfall on the bottom, creating a lot of erosion where we want to try to see that stabilized with a rock apron. All right, uh, here we see the top tool, but uh, one of the questions we get often are, will in-stream culvert replacements be required as part of the permit? No, is the short answer. Um, drainage culverts, yes. Culvert headers, yes, like here we have a typical um, pour material, uh, poorly installed culvert that um, we want to see some good material here and some stone around this header. We have a lot of, uh, in this case, erosion coming from the road and also from, from the brook. All roads will be covered by the permit, classes one through four, as I mentioned, uh, in that road type table. Um, including class four roads, but the requirements or standards or practices for class four roads are gonna be a lot less stringent for class four roads. Might be able to be a little more creative on class four road that they're not traveled too well. Instead of putting in a bunch of drainage culverts and you wanna get water off the road, we could put in uh, water bars or broad base dips um, to get water off the road. Towns, uh, we, uh, Marie and Matt and I went, we were at the uh, road foreman, county road foreman meeting this afternoon, and there were 40 or so towns there, um, uh, or 40 people uh, in the room, and most everybody in the room has, uh, the towns have adopted the existing road bridge standards, which is a, a very high rate. Um, and we often get this question, you know, how, how is the standards for this permit gonna be, um, work with the existing standards, the road and bridge standards. Um, and we're, we're working very closely with VTRANS on this. And we're gonna try to get our standards to match as closely as possible. Where they will be different and where they will be applied within a town. So we may have the same, those practices that we've just seen may ultimately be the practices or the standards. But this permit will only be applied to those high priority segments of, of roadway, so those connected or priority segments of road. A town adopts standards, existing standards that applies town-wide. Yet the question as well, we have in that time frame slide earlier, we have a draft permit due at the end of this year, a final permit due a year from then. Um, towns will begin applying for coverage sometime 2018 or later. And so we have a lot of towns that want to get ahead of this, get ahead of the curve, and, and we don't yet have the standards, uh, and we will be having that by the end of the year, and, and again, the final standards a year from now. So it's hard to know what we're gonna to require towns to do until we have the permit in place and have the standards in place. But the no-brainer is if, t if towns are addressing road erosion problems in close proximities to waters, any surface water, and they're identifying those and they're beginning to address those, they will be a lot closer to uh, being in compliance with the permit as it comes out. That's, that's kind of a, a no-brainer for us at this point. Uh, there's a lot of money, uh, grant money out there now. Uh, the Better Back Roads uh, grant RFP just came out last week. Uh, it's due on April 15th. Um, the money this year compared to last year's round has tripled um, and that includes multiple categories that towns can apply and not just one category. Generally in the past a town would get one implementation grant even if they apply, uh, 
put in several uh, submissions. Uh, this year, there are four different grant categories. There's an inventory category. There's the traditional road best management practices that we've seen here. There's a stream bank stabilization category, um, and also a culvert replacement category. And the culvert replacement and stream bank uh, categories are $40,000, up to $40,000, 80% cost share. Um, and the traditional best management, road best management practices are up to $25,000. Uh, from up from 10,000 and the inventory is up to 8,000 from 5,000 so every, each category has gone up and there are new categories and towns can apply for multiple categories. So what's next? We're, this year um, we <coughs> are developing our draft permit. Um, we have our first um, we're calling it a core team meeting later this week and that's mostly uh, agency natural resources, DC staff from the Worship Management Division VTRANS staff, uh, the Ver regional planning co commissions will be represented, the Vermont League and cities and towns will be at those meetings, and that, that will help guide the process of how we develop this permit. Um, so that's, uh, that's one, one of our, our teams. We also have a technical team um, that will uh, be looking at what the standards, what the practices are themselves, looking at the science behind these practices, what works, what doesn't work. Here in Vermont, other states, online research, we're trying to come up with, uh, in the past we'd say if it's less than 5% slope, we grass line it, and more than 5% slope, we stone line it. We want to kind of dive in a little bit deeper into the science, see what actually works in the field, other alternatives uh, that towns can use. Um, we're, we're looking at, again, those different road types and matching the practices to the road type. Um, we're, and we're looking at that connectivity, that road uh, prior, segment priority criteria, you know, what's going to, how are we going to delineate that road watershed out in the field? So that's some, something we're looking at. And I'll be looking at you folks here, um, and um, if invited back, I will come back. If folks want me to come back to this meeting, to the TAC meeting, um, or the road foreman meeting, to keep getting input from folks in the different regions, and as I travel around the state, there are different uh, co uh, concerns, depending on where you are. Uh, in Addison County, there's a lot of big agricultural issues that road foremen are very concerned about um, related to farmers bringing in uh, um, water quality issues from ag fields um, up in the Northeast Kingdom. It, there's some logging issues. So depending on where you are in the state, there are different, different issues that are maybe relative to the different regions. And where we want to really want to get at the practices and where they work and why they work and why they don't work as it, as it applies to the different areas of the state. Um, so um, I'll be reaching out to, to the county road foreman and tax. We'll also be having a roads roundtable. We have uh, road foreman to road foreman exchanges on how, they, how they're putting in practices, how they're maintaining practices, kind of brainstorming sessions. Um, and uh, I, I can open things up for uh, questions. This is, we have our website, it's kind of a long link here, <laughs> um, but there is, this slideshow is on this website. We have uh, frequently asked questions and fact sheet about the permit and my contact information here. I also have some cards too, but. I have a two part question. Sure. What are uh, the penalties for non compliance? And this seems to be pretty straightforward. This is what we're gonna do. Uh, how do we, negotiate with landowners to say, well, you're not going to put your water on my land. Uh, and we, you know, so the sunken road syndrome, how do you deal with landowners on that? And you know the one we're talking about with that. I mean, it's not a... Well, uh, yeah, there's good, really good questions. Um, as far as compliance, and I've had, we've had this question at the, at the road forum meeting, or uh, might have been after the road forum meeting, but um, that all, all the towns in the room have adopted the existing road bridge standards um, but they're saying that is anybody checking and and where we where we kind of draw the line the difference between the existing standards and adopting the standards and this this is a water quality general permit which is enforceable and which is which um, the, the plan is that every year DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, will be auditing a certain percentage of the towns and state 
So if we have 250 municipalities in the state, every year a certain percentage of those towns, there would be site visits, and if towns are sending us, so the idea of a general permit is the towns are self-reporting. They're doing a road inventory. They're showing where, where the high priority segments are, which ones meet the standards, which ones don't. The ones that don't meet the standards, they're going to come up with a plan. So, so if they're saying in, the, in um, their annual report to us that these segments already meet standards, and we go out and we look at those segments and they don't meet standards, they're, they're, they can be fined. What the fine is, the number, I don't know, we don't know yet, but, but they will be checked and there will be fine, penalties. fine penalties for non-compliance. Um, um, and the other question uh, about outletting on, <coughs> we hear that often, I spend a lot of time with road foreman, site visits, and that's the, the biggest concern that road foreman have. And, and I think we can collectively do a better job getting word out to the public that, that road crews need to get the water off the road, and it's a water quality issue. It's also a public safety issue, um, and that um, that's where we have, so we can't get the water off the road, that's where we have road failures and these flash floods that we get. Um, and, and the landowner doesn't want a little bit of sediment on the hay field or, or the lawn if we do let water off, we get rid of those shoulder berms and we get water off in, in many places, it's better than concentrating water in one turnout where you can have a water quality discharge of sediment onto the land, but if you're letting it off everywhere, it's gonna be very minor in a lot of places versus one major outlet. And, and I, think, I think we all need to do a better job, and road foremen are allowed to do that um, in statute in Title 19, um, in maintaining their right-of-ways and their drainages. Um, they legally are allowed to do that, and they will be required to do that as part of this permit. So I could be the bad guy. And um, we hear that a lot, but the road foreman don't want. They say, well, we, we want out at the water, but that guy won't let us. And that guy's friends with the selectmen. And I, we hear that often. And it's, it's local politics, um, but they're going to be required to, to do that. Okay. And the sunken road issue, <laughs> if you come up with a good answer, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we have had... Um, that ties in with the other part of that question, and yeah. sunken road with the landowner. Yeah. We have had some examples where it's sunken for a couple hundred feet, and then where the road is lower than the sides, and then the, the, the profile changes, and then the road gets higher, uh, and you have opportunities to get the water off, or you have to put <coughs> ditches on either side, you know, maybe make it wider and, and open up ditches on e either side, or if it's too narrow, pitch the ground to one side, inslope it or outslope it to one side. And as long as you can get the water off the, the traveled lane and into a ditch or into a turnout is, is how, how to do it. Each site is very different. And some sites we have ledge issues, and we have springs, and we have all these other issues we have to, so it's very site specific. Okay. Yeah. One question that came up um, th this morning it included the, uh, how does this general permit relate to private roads, specific to, um, well obviously residential private roads, but then also the Mount Snows, the, the Stratons, um, that, where they're maintaining their own roadway and how would that be impacted? Um, the short answer is uh, the only uh, through uh, Act 64 we have jurisdiction within the road right away, municipal right away. So what's in and out of that is a little fuzzy right, right now legally. But we do, as we said at the meeting this afternoon, there are issues where in that farmer example in Addison County if that tile drain is coming out into the road ditch or that log um, <coughs> landing is causing a lot of sediment to come into the, the town roadway or that steep private driveway we hear very often um, the bad angle from the driveway um, that undersized driveway culvert um, that long steep stretch of driveway that really has to be regulated at the town level and and we would encourage towns to <coughs> strengthen their ordinances related to driveways. Um, 
and as we said earlier, there's going to be the new required agricultural practices. We'll have a 10-foot uh, filter area between any um, row crop and a town road. So that's a start. It's not ideal, but it's something. Um, the accepted uh, practices, management practice for logging, that's being revised right now as well. There's an opportunity to provide input to that. On the logging side, so we have different land uses. If we look at the land uses, we have logging, we have ag, and we have private. Um, and private really has to be done at the municipal level. Other questions, comments? Just a uh, general question about the use of chloride uh, with municipal roadworks, and I'm wondering how that's regulated or how that's treated within this larger context. Good question. Um, I've asked for some clarification about that um, because the original intent was. We go back to the, the you know the first slide here was it's the origins of this were Lake Champlain um, and sediment and nutrients. That was the main goal, and that broadened when you go into the Connecticut River and nitrogen issues um, and phosphorus issues in Lake Memphis, Magog in the north. So if you most of the state, they're they're either having uh, they're having sediment and nutrient issues. Those are the primary water quality issues. Um, chloride is an issue. It's this that's specifically an issue. Uh, a lot of Chittenden County impaired small streams that are impaired. I don't know, Maria, are there any are there any chloride impaired down this no, way? No, but we have. Certainly, chloride issues. They're, they're not there yet. Um, I was uh, told that this permit would not go after chloride. Um, we do have some good guidance uh, that we could do a better job in doing outreach to towns as far as when to apply chloride, how to apply it. Um, some towns are experimenting with the pre brine treatment um, as a way to reducing chloride applications by putting temperature uh, sensors um, in the, the town um, equipment so they're, they're only using chloride at the temperatures, the road surface temperature, so they have a sensor on the road surface, having their, uh, their uh, spreaders, salt spreaders calibrated that they're only using the, the right amount. There's some, there's some some voluntary best management practices that towns could be improving, so they're wasting their money if they're putting it on when they don't need to because of the temperature is not right and it's not going to make a difference or they're putting too much on on their application rate. Um, but one thing that we didn't cover here that will likely be part of the permit is um, town sand sheds or sand piles that are on in floodplains and on uh, discharging to a waterway that would not necessarily having to require them to be covered but not discharging into a waterway. So this could evolve um, down the road in a few years and include more. Um, Marie and I were out in the field today looking at a lot of river road, call, we call them river road conflict issues, uh, the tropical storm Irene type of situation where the road embankment, um, the river takes out the road and, and then the road is in the river and that's a water quality issue. Um, that is not going to be covered in this permit. This is so we have kind of these sideboards at least to start. I don't know if, I, if I answered that question. Other questions, comments, thoughts, recommendations? Well, the only other question I have is. Um, if the municipalities are going to be assessed a certain cost for this implementation of this act. Do you have any knowledge of that aspect? Um, starting um, sometime 2018 or later, uh, the fee, there's a uh, one-time fee of $400 and an annual fee of $2,000 per town per year. That was set by the legislature last session before I started this job. <laughs> but there's been talk of maybe uh, make prorating it, maybe depending on how many road miles are in each town, as a, a fairer way to do it.
So that could be addressed in this upcoming legislative session? I, or is well, it it's really, it's, it's up to the legislature to, um, to figure out how, how, how to equalize that, how and when um, to do that. But it, I, I get a sense it probably won't be this session. Well, uh, if folks have any follow-up questions, uh, my contact information, I have some um, business cards, too, that I can hand out to folks. Um, and uh, we'll keep the communication going, and I'm uh, glad to come back if folks would like to see me back to answer questions down the road as we develop the permit a little bit more. Thanks for taking the time to come down. Thanks for coming. Good Thank to see you, you again. Thank you. Thank you.